For decades in Britain, thousands of vulnerable children were systematically abused by gangs of men, and yet no one dared speak out. We'd seen so many girls who'd experienced this situation. We got to the point where we thought somebody's going to have to die before anything is done. The victims were groomed, drugged and raped. And this was happening across vast parts of the country. It was happening in Birmingham, it was happening in Bradford, it was happening in Manchester. How come every single aspect of the British establishment treated every single case that had cropped up as an isolated one-off case with no pattern whatsoever to any of the other cases that were so similar? But there was a pattern, one that risked reigniting delicate race relations, particularly in the North. This was a white and Asian youth. The in the Northwest are integrally linked to the success of the British National there was absolutely no getting away from the facts that the victims were young white children and that the offenders were older Pakistani men. Once those facts became understood by the powers that be, I think that they made a conscious decision that they weren't going to open up that box. It was allowed to slide away and it was buried. The abuse took place in plain sight. And yet professionals chose to look the other way and say nothing. As the years passed, the silence grew deafening. Inflammatory voices stepped in. My blood has boiled. The system has failed us. They have not protected our boys. Social services failed. Educators failed. Health professionals failed. Police prosecutors. There is none. There is no agency I can think of has got this right. The trial has begun of 11 men accused of sexually abusing girls as young as 13. I don't care what faith or what colour somebody is. These are perpetrators. These are abusers. I don't care whether they damage community relations. Bring them to justice. This film uncovers why a wall of silence surrounded the on-street grooming of young girls. Why these children's cries for help were ignored again and again. And how, over a decade, this pattern of monstrous sexual abuse was finally forced out into the open. In 2003, with an alarming rise of teenage pregnancy across the country, the Labour government of the day created numerous outreach centres to offer sexual health advice to the young and vulnerable. What's going wrong with sex education? One of these centres was on the outskirts of Rochdale, a deprived borough of Greater Manchester. No sooner had it opened its doors than the staff of ten began to hear stories far more worrying than they'd anticipated. Very quickly we started to identify a a number of young people who were incredibly vulnerable, who were engaging in sexual, sexual activity which wasn't necessarily by choice. It was something that they felt they needed to do. It became a situation where we would identify one girl who was vulnerable and then she would come along with her other friends and they were equally vulnerable. We got little snippets of information from each girl about you know, their life, really, and what they were experiencing. They would tell us that their boyfriend was a taxi driver or that they were enjoying getting really drunk at weekend and at a party where there were lots of adult men. From the age of 12, I moved from care home to care home. You never actually got any love. Life was just crap all the time. When I first got involved, it was for fun. They were my friends. I could actually talk to them and they wouldn't judge me. They'd be giving me drink and drugs. I just thought, oh, free party, I don't mind. I was 13. Back then, drinking was this dead excited thing. So while I would drink, then we'd just go drive around up on the moors and stuff like that. It became like an everyday thing, not just like a weekend thing. I thought, oh, this is fun. You know, when you're younger, you hang around with someone a lot older, you think, like, you get, like, a little buzz out of it. I just threw myself out there and thought I was invincible. 
I wasn't scared of nothing or no one. She was full of life but had run away from council care as many as 50 times. Today, Manchester Social Services expressed their shock at the death of 15-year-old Victoria Agoglia, but said such tragedies were not always preventable. Victoria died at the weekend from a suspected drugs overdose after disappearing from a children's home in Rochdale. Two men are being questioned in connection with her death. Victoria was probably 13 or 14 when I first met her. She'd found herself in a situation that was way beyond her control. She just wanted us to help her. She was really bright, um, funny um, and engaging. Um, she made me want to work with her. I met her about three times. On the fourth occasion I was due to see her, I read in the news that, she'd, uh, that sh she was dead. Victoria had a long and troubled history with the police and social services. So her death threw up a warning flag within Greater Manchester Police. They suspected that it might be more than a simple drug overdose. DC Maggie Oliver, known for her sensitivity and delicate work with vulnerable and grieving families, was called in by her superiors. I saw a photo of this beautiful young girl um, and this letter that was heartbreaking. She was 13 years old and talking about having been abused by so many men that she couldn't count. I'm only 13. I've got the rest of my life ahead of me. She didn't think she was ashamed of, loved her family and felt she'd let them down. I slept with people older than me. Half of them I don't even know. It was name. really a, a cry for help. I'm a slag and that's nothing to be proud of. And they treated me like shit. She died of a drugs overdose, but we knew that she had been abused on a massive scale. Myself and the two officers that I was working with, we were asked to undertake what was called at the time, a, and I quote, a scoping exercise, where we would really have um, free reign under the, the daily supervision of um, an, a detective inspector to go out and really find out whether we had a problem with children being systematically groomed and sexually abused by gangs in the Greater Manchester area. That was the starting point for Operation Augusta. It was not the first time such stories had echoed around northern cities and towns. Rumours of the sexual abuse of young girls by gangs had circulated for years. Twelve months earlier, in the West Yorkshire town of Keithley, a local Labour MP had been faced with more than just hearsay. Some seven mothers came to see me, and they had genuine concerns about the way their daughters were being abused uh, by this gang. It had all started from having a boyfriend at school, a very handsome, attractive young man from the Pakistani community, who then handed them on to much older men. The mothers had ganged up together in order to get the police to be active on it. The police kept saying to them that due to the fact that they felt fairly sure that the girls had been consenting, uh, probably under the influence of drugs and drink, but consenting, uh, there was nothing they could do. Nearly all of these girls were 12 and 13 whether it had been with consent or without consent, it was a criminal offence. I had no doubts in my own mind about it. I really wanted to help them, and I wanted it to stop. Within a couple of weeks of GMP starting the scoping exercise, Maggie Oliver and her two colleagues had gathered the names of 17 child victims and numerous alleged perpetrators. They knew that the vast majority of sexual abuse is committed by white men in the home. But here, something very different seemed to be taking place. The deeper down we started to dig, the, the more it, it became absolutely abundantly clear that the children being targeted were similar kinds of children, young, white, from difficult backgrounds, not all in care, but had had difficult starts in life. The makeup of the offenders was almost exclusively of Pakistani origin. And it isn't predominantly Asian men, it's predominantly Pakistani men. In 
Every weekend we used to go. It was a laugh and a joke. And you know, you used to get what you wanted out of it. Because you used to get beer and your fags. Then they changed. And wanted more than just giving you free beer. You just said, I bought you beer, now let's have sex. Somebody else would come with a bottle of vodka. And then that person would expect the same as the person before. Then they bring another friend with another bottle of vodka and some more fags. And then he'd expect the same as what the person before. It just escalated from there. Just kept going more and more and more. I was 14. My friend used to go out with Pakistani men. One night she took me out as well. I didn't know any Pakistani people. I only saw them in takeaways and driving taxis. They go on like they like you. They want to be boyfriend. I actually believed them. I was 14 years old. They bought us drinks. I thought, oh, I'll have some of this. It got to the point where I was really drunk. One slept with my friend, and then after he's finished, another went in and slept with her. Then they'd done the same with me. Slightly was passing us about. There were often occasions when girls were there outside our building at 8.30, quarter past eight in the morning. They were waiting for us to arrive. They'd been up all night. They were really smelly, totally dishevelled really frightened. There was one girl who'd been dumped on the moors. She'd walked about six miles to get to our building. She'd been raped. She'd been thrown out of a car. Um, that there were a number of men who'd had intercourse with her. I got myself in, like, some really bad states. I used to always go there because there was someone to talk to. I used to tell him everything. I just felt safer. There was a woman who used to work in the clinic. She was like a sister. She was like, what are you doing? She used to say to me like, these men, they don't love you. They're not gonna marry you. They're not gonna take you back home to the mum. You're there to do stuff with them and then go. That ain't love. Getting you drunk and then abusing you. We called the police every time. We spoke to the police every time. I kept being told, the police can't do anything unless you have a victim, OK? You only have a victim if the victim is prepared to make a statement. Now, often, the children couldn't articulate that anyway. They couldn't articulate. But aside from that, I think they were really frightened. They were really frightened of the consequences. They'd been hit, threatened, I know where you live, I know who your mum is, I'll kill members of your family. I think they were frightened as well about my parents might be disappointed or I might get in trouble at school or my friends might find out, you know. All, all of which is a child mind, it's a child way of thinking. I knew that this problem of on-street grooming was a real problem and it needed to be tackled. The only way to progress the investigation was to get children who were prepared, um, or a child who was prepared to, to tell me, or one of us, what was happening to them. One of the children, I spent a considerable amount of time talking to her and trying to gain her trust. Once I'd started to gain a trust, she agreed to take me on a drive round of the area. She was telling us that they were being taken to various premises along what we call in Manchester the Curry Mile. Many of the locations were like flats above the takeaway places. On one of the drive rounds, we drove past a vehicle. She ducked down in the front of the car 
and said that car across the road with that man driving it, that is one of the men that abused me. Met the taxi drivers through like the people in the kebab houses. Used to drive us to places where takeaway people were telling us to take us. Then we meet another taxi driver, then another one, and another one. You just get out of one car and go in another car. Then they tell you to trust that taxi driver. Don't worry, trust him. It'll be all right. And then you go in that taxi driver's car. Then you do sex with him, and then you go on to another taxi driver's car. Fifty miles away in West Yorkshire, the local MP was struggling to get the attention she'd hoped for. I probably went to see the police about once a month over a 12, 18 months period. Uh, and uh, they always had a new excuse for not doing anything. I followed it up with the head of social services at that time. And uh, she told me, well, uh, there's not a great deal we can do because these children are not in care. Uh, they're with their parents, and therefore it's the responsibility of the parents, not of the local authority. Church leaders from across West Yorkshire have signed a statement calling on voters to reject the British National Party at the local and European... With little interest from the authorities, Anne Cryer decided to appeal to community leaders who might be able to intervene. As this was a particularly sensitive issue, she turned to an intermediary. I approached a local Muslim Labour councillor. I had him come in and listen to the story of these women. He was clearly very moved by their stories. I asked him, would he be prepared to take this list of young men uh, down to the mosque after Friday prayers and, and see the elders? I'd wanted them to make it clear that in the view of the elders, they are behaving in a totally un-Islamic way and it will bring shame on them, on their family and on their religion if they continue to behave in this way. He went down, he saw them, he gave them the list, they all looked at these lists and they all agreed, yes, they knew all the lads, they knew the families, they knew where they lived, everything about them. And then they said, really, it's got nothing to do with us. End of story. I was horrified and disappointed the BNP were becoming active and they were going to uh, have a field day on this. I didn't want that to happen. From then on, uh, I started to try to um, get the media involved. Petition asking voters to say no to racism. The BMP now has a toehold in Yorkshire, with more seats being contested in the forthcoming May elections. The key point of the press release was that the men who were doing this to these girls were, I think the word used was from the Asian community. I spoke to Anne Cryer's researcher. She told me that the scale of this was, was far greater than they'd been able to say in the, the initial press release. They'd identified over 30 men who were involved. The idea of young girls, 13, 14, being befriended by lads who weren't much older than them initially and then introduced to a wider and wider circle of friends, the idea that this was in some way a, a collective activity, that girls were being passed around men, um, I'd, I'd not encountered anything like that before. I remember so clearly the feeling of how, how on earth do you report a story that is a fantasy for the, for the far right. It's, it's everything um, you could wish for if you're pushing a, a particular agenda. It's innocent white girls and it's evil, dark-skinned men. The government's failure to control asylum and immigration was a force for bad. Norfolk's fears were not without foundation. The BNP's vote in recent local elections had increased 300-fold in only three years, winning them seats on councils across northern towns. 
With a general election looming, immigration, race and asylum were key topics of the day. Yes, it is true that we need to control immigration. Yes, it is important we discuss it, but it's an issue that should be dealt with, not exploited. For my shame, I allowed my liberal fear about um, uh, giving sucker and credence to the British National Party uh, to act as a breaker on actually doing my job. Norfolk decided not to write an article. New in the job as the Times Northern correspondent, he turned his attention to less inflammatory issues across the region, unaware that the phenomenon wasn't limited to Keithley. We phoned the police, we phoned children's social care. They were stuck in that position of, we're the police, we do this. We're social services, we do this. You know, I started to feel as though I was facing a great big brick wall. I started to send letters rather than making a phone call. I, uh, because the police can't ignore a letter. Um, they can ignore or not record a phone call. But if you send a letter, they can't ignore that. So I would send duplicate letters to the police, to social services. My child protection lead also had a copy of the information that I was sharing. So it had gone everywhere. You know, enough people had detail around an event. <laughs> I kept hoping that what at least somebody, one of those professionals, would respond or do or, you know, help, really. Twelve months from opening its doors, the staff at CIT had lodged more than a dozen cases with police and social services. As far as they knew, no action had been taken. Yet the accounts of abuse continued. I used to blame myself, but then the next weekend it'd be the same. They'll be ringing you saying, I've not seen you for ages, I've missed you. That little bit of attention you get, you get excited off it, feeling that you're wanted or somebody thinks you're really attractive, makes you feel good about yourself. They took me to London, Blackburn, Huddersfield, Bradford, Birmingham, places like that. I've woke up in like a house, like a derelict building, just like a bed there. And I've woke up not knowing where I am or how I got there. I've had no clothes on, freezing cold, and there's nowhere to be seen. At Greater Manchester Police Headquarters, after six months of investigation, Maggie Oliver's scoping exercise was drawing to a close. She was getting ready to make her case to her superiors. I personally wrote the report. I started it with the photograph of Victoria and her letter. Anybody who read that report had to see that picture and had to read that letter. I wanted a, a powerful message to go to senior officers that the human consequences of not addressing this massive problem of on-street grooming now, professionally and properly, could lead and would lead to other children being in Victoria's position. I want that abuse to stop. Mr Speaker, may I begin by... I had hoped that I would get on board comrades in the Labour Party, and many were. Many were genuinely sympathetic uh, to what I was talking about and uh, supporting me in every way. Uh, but there was a small number who uh, either uh, very openly or perhaps whisper, whisper, you know, sort of were saying things that uh, uh, perhaps I was something of a racist. And that was very upsetting. I'm absolutely convinced it was a, a political correctitude gone mad. Uh, you know, th there was absolutely no reason for it. I was rocking the multicultural boat, but how do you get changes without talking about it? In May 2004, Maggie Oliver and her colleagues finished and presented the Augusta report. The assistant chief constable accepted fully what we were saying. 
He didn't dispute it at all. He accepted that Greater Manchester Police Area had a problem with on-street grooming. We had word back that um, Greater Manchester Police fully accepted we had a problem and they were going to re resource Operation Augusta with a full major incident team. Um, and the team I was working with, we were over the moon. This problem was going to be addressed. Um, you know, I've, we, we've got one child that's died. I'm thinking we can address this, we can stop it growing. You know, we're going to do it. My husband was terminally ill with cancer. I was needed at home. My husband needed me. I've got four children and I um, went off work to, um, to, to look after my husband through his final three months. I kind of felt that I can walk away from this, I can go and concentrate on my family. All our hard work had paid off. This problem was going to be addressed. The British National Party is launching its election manifesto this lunchtime. The party, which wants an end to all immigration, is fielding more than 100 candidates, four times as many as at the 2001 election. This was all time to coincide with St George's Day celebrations. At last year's European elections, the BNP received almost a million votes, proof they say that they're moving forward. In May 2005, the BNP stood in larger numbers than ever before in a UK general election. They called for withdrawal from the EU, an end to immigration and multiculturalism, and warned of the creeping power of Islam. Their message found support across northern cities and towns, particularly when they added the grooming of white working-class children to their campaign. Griffin made this announcement. He was coming to take on Anne Cryer as the uh, BNP candidate for Keithley to protect these vulnerable white girls. What Anne Cryer dismisses as grooming and what is really racist paedophilia has been going on in Keithley for at least 10 years. For most of that time, Anne Cryer's been in charge and she's turned a blind eye to the problem. All they wanted to do was to have confrontation and to uh, demonstrate how virtuous they, the BMP, were. They did nothing. They did nothing to help and nothing to assist either the white girls or any other girl. Uh, it was just dreadful. This town should be on everybody's lips as the place where those paedophile drug rapes went on. Because 60, and 60 of our children, 60, well one is too many, but 60 is a, is a massive rape wave. It's something, it's astounding. The leader of the British National Party, Nick Griffin, has been arrested on suspicion of incitement to commit racial hatred. He was recorded on tape saying that Islam was a vicious, wicked faith and warning supporters to stand up to Muslims. Police insist it is a coincidence that the BMP leader had to come here to be charged the day after a general election was called. The British National Party, though, were determined to make the most of the time. One of the speeches for which I'm accused of inciting racial hatred was talking about the endemic problem of heroin and grooming of young girls. I think it's very important that these issues are got out and are discussed. I will keep on telling the truth. My colleagues in the British National Party will keep on telling the truth. Yeah. And however many of us they jail, however long they jail us, we will keep on telling the truth until the truth prevails. Yeah. I never thought he would win, but I felt that it was going to do a great deal of damage to race relations. Working class people on small estates were being indoctrinated by these racist lies. Knocking on a door near you, the British National Party, branded extremists by their opponents, the party says it's gathering support nonetheless. The senior police officer in charge said to the parents of girls who are being groomed for illegal underage sex by Muslim paedophiles, he said, get used to it. There's nothing we can do. It's a fact of life. The police knew about it, but nothing ever, ever got done.
You know, a few times the police have turned up at a house where we've all been drinking. And you know, I've been upset saying things have happened. They don't really listen. I'm crying to the police, but you've got all the men stood there. They're all just saying, ignore her, she's drunk. I'm crying, I'm screaming, I was upset, I was hurt. And the police are like, oi, enough is enough. Then you're the one who gets arrested when all you're doing is crying out for a bit of help. The BNP didn't win in Keithley or anywhere else across the country, but their vote increased fourfold. The party had exploited an underlying anxiety about multicultural Britain, an anxiety that was to boil over in the summer of 2005. There were four explosions bringing chaos to parts of the capital. More Terror bombs explode across London uh, and inside page after page of harrowing uh, personal stories. Ever seen and the in the United Kingdom. Well, the first bomb was on a tube train between Liverpool Street and Moorgate. Within days, three of the four bombers were identified as British-born Muslims. In the Asian community, there were fears that the entire community would be made scapegoats. As, as a white man in this country, have you ever felt under suspicion? Have you ever been made to feel uncomfortable in your own country? Have you ever been made to feel uncomfortable in your own skin? Rising Islamophobia, which the far right was helping to stoke, meant the police faced a difficult challenge. They carried out raids and increased surveillance to try and root out terror cells. At the same time, they had to maintain social cohesion and make sure that any action they took wasn't perceived as racist. Operation Augusta was a full-on major incident team investigation when I went off work. I came back to work in September and the job had died a death. It had just gone, fizzled out, shut down. I couldn't believe it. I was incredulous. This was systematic, organised sexual abuse. They weren't just picking one child out of the ether. These were groups of children that they were being targeted. And it was like a production line, you know, one and then another. So what was happening to all these children now? Who was dealing with this kind of crime? Nobody. It, it was being buried. With the authorities' attention elsewhere, most of the world remained oblivious to the abuse. But rumblings about it continued and reached at least one prominent member of the local Pakistani community. It was the month of fasting Ramadan. I'd gone to a friend's for prayers and breaking our fast. He was a taxi driver. He told me about uh, rumours that were going on of taxi drivers who were sharing uh, young teenage girls uh, in Rochdale. Uh, that's all he told me. I heard those rumours again and again, and I was trying to understand what were the implications if this had been going on. I'm a Muslim, proud British Muslim. I came up uh, and, and grew up in this country. There is nothing, absolutely nothing in my faith, Islam, that justifies uh, these type of despicable and evil crimes. I wanted to talk to people and try to find out what was going on. Nobody in the Pakistani community wanted to talk about these issues. Nobody seemed to want to help. Many people were coming to me and saying to me, oh yes, well this is what the BNP were doing in Bradford, this is what the BNP were doing in Keithley, this is all a far-right conspiracy about demonizing minority communities. In, in my mind, it was our silence that was allowing the BNP to campaign on this issue. I felt totally alone. There was no one to help me, no one who would listen. So it just went on. One time I was at a house in Oldham. I was drinking, I was doing speed, and I was just getting off my trolley. I didn't think anything of it. I was just generally having a good time. When I came round, I didn't know where I was. I just couldn't move. I was on a single bed. There was a double bed next to me. 
There were just men coming in and out. It just seemed like one after another. They were all laughing and joking, pleasing themselves with my useless body that I couldn't move. It kept getting light and then dark. I could see what was going on. I could feel what was going on. There was a couple of guys that came in with another girl. She'd done it willingly. She just turned around and looked at me and went, you'll get used to it. We all do. In August 2008, Greater Manchester Police received a call from a kebab shop. A drunk teenage girl had kicked off and was smashing the glass counter. Standard fare for a Friday night. Known as Girl A, her case would in time become a crucial step in bringing on-street grooming out into the open. We got a phone call from the police. Asked us as a responsible adult or parent or whatever to come down to the police station. I thought to myself, oh no, not again. What's she done this time? What the hell has she raised today? I went to the police station. She was agitated and very upset. She also seemed to be withdrawn at the same time. Um, she you could see that she was clearly was hiding something. Um, she didn't want to say something, but, you know, after I spoke to her and said, look, what's going on? What's the matter? She told them that she'd been raped several times. The policeman, he took it down and said, for what it's worth, I believe you. We've heard of this before and I believe you. I was totally, totally in shock. There's no other way to describe it. You're a father, you're supposed to look after your children. You know, it's your job, it's your duty to look after your children and protect them. And I tried and, and I, I failed. Girl A was one of the dozens of girls the CIT team had identified as victims of abuse in the four years it had been open. Details of all the assaults had been passed to police and social services, yet it seemed no action had been taken. We wrote everything down, everything down that a girl had said to us. It was just a very practical work situation, but eventually we had two filing cabinets full of case files of young people who at some point we had identified as being abused. Different girls were naming different people they were involved with and different abusers. Often girls would say, that's a friend of somebody, or he hangs around with that person. The easiest way to collate that information was to write those names into a book. In the office, we just called it the boyfriend book. If there was a name beginning with A, we would write A, Hamed, age, any detail about a car, any detail about who they were associated with. And then at any point in the future, if another girl talked about Ahmed, we were able to see there was Ahmed and he was cross-referenced in somebody else's notes. What became really clear was that the abuse went in waves. There was a big group of girls really early on, around 2003, 2004, and we realised that one was associated with that one, who was associated with another one, and then names of boyfriends started to be really familiar. And then suddenly there was a totally separate, younger group of girls, all of them interconnected, all of them experiencing the same kind of abuse. We were then able to do a kind of a spider diagram. That girl was associated with that girl who was associated with that boy who all knew this other person. They'd all been associated with a blue Volkswagen. 
They'd all been to a warehouse somewhere. It was really naive, but it, we were able to map out who had been associated with who at different points. I put my faith and my trust in the police. And I said to my mates at the time, look, the police have arrested them. The police have charged them. Justice will take its course and, you know, basically and hopefully, they'll go to jail. A few months down the line, they decided that they weren't going to pursue it anymore. I knew that knickers had been recovered and I knew that DNA evidence had been recovered and that basically the semen of, of one of these animals um, was in her knickers. It's a smoking gun, that's, that's red-handed. Simple as that. And I don't think that any sane human being could disagree with me. Ooh, how can, you know, <laughs> how did Seaman get there? It was the Crown Prosecution Service who dropped it. They said that my daughter, she probably wouldn't be believed in court. She wasn't a credible witness. It's just ridiculous. You know, I know very well that there was an excellent case there. I was totally devastated. You, you can't be anything else. How, how on earth could this be allowed to happen? About three or four days after a leaflet come through the door from the BMP, it, it said things that just made sense, really. I gave him a ring. Um, a gentleman come out and, you know what I mean, uh, I'd said what happened to my daughter and, um, they basically said to me right away, well, you know, we know about this. They were listening to me. No one else had listened to me, but they even knew that I was on about, and they knew entirely about the whole problem. Everyone else had said there isn't a problem, or just denying it existed, or, oh, you can't say that, that's racist. I joined on the spot. I knew I was going to ruffle a few feathers and upset a few people. We live in a time of rising Islamophobia, rising bigotry towards immigrant communities in this country, and there were a lot of people saying it's best to just leave this particular issue alone. I got told that I was bringing um, you know, the community down by talking about these issues, and they didn't want me to talk about this and raise these issues. But, you know, let's change those white girls and replace them with Asian girls, Pakistani girls. What would our reaction be then? Would our imams remain silent? Would our community leaders bury their head in the sun as we often did? I don't think they would. I live in a community, I have family in the community, and so for me it was a real struggle because I was somebody who championed the British Pakistani community and suddenly I was then the person who was engaged in pointing the figure at my own community. I think all of us, whether in the Pakistani community, whether the authorities, the council, all turned a blind eye to it. Complete silence. I was with these men in a house in Rochdale. I was already drunk, I was always drunk. There was like a lock on the door and they locked it. They were just laughing at me because I was throwing up over the side of the bed. They thought it was highly hilarious. There was a guy with a razor blade come up to me and said, I'm going to cut you. You want me to cut you? The other guy came up to me and said, just lay down, lay down. And I did, thinking nothing of it. I was crying because I was being sick and I hate being sick. The guy with the razor blade, he kept coming up to me with it, holding it by my throat, telling me he was going to slit my throat. He was laughing. One of them pulled my trousers down while I was in the middle of being sick and inserted himself while the guy with the razor blade had the razor up to my throat. The other guy was just stood there watching 
and he said to the one with the razor blade, he said, just hold it there, and he kept trying to put himself in my mouth. The whole time I had the guy at the bottom of the bed raping me. I actually thought I was going to get my throat slit. Seven years after shelving a potentially explosive story, journalist Andrew Norfolk found his conscience calling him. As the years went by, I had this very uncomfortable feeling that I hadn't done my job. I was on a long weekend. I was driving up to Scotland. I had the radio on. A news item came on the BBC. Greater Manchester Police have been describing how a 14-year-old girl was forced to endure an absolutely horrifying ordeal after being forced into prostitution. The vulnerable teenager was targeted with vodka and cigarettes after she was spotted wandering the streets before she was made to have sex with a string of men. At no stage in the report had the names of the defendants been read out. I'm sitting in my car in the middle of nowhere and I'm thinking... You've not heard a word about this case until five minutes ago. And yet, with every fibre of my being, I bet I do know something about those men, because I bet when I check it out, they're going to be Muslim names. So I got back, I looked it up. They were all Muslim names, Muslim men. I sat down that night and I wrote a very long email to the news editor of the Times saying that I thought there was something really troubling going on here, that it wasn't being acknowledged, um, and that I needed some time to look into the story to see whether what I thought was a pattern was indeed a pattern. As Andrew said to work, demonstrations were sweeping across the country, led by the emerging face of the far right, the English Defence League. Its members were young, organised and growing in numbers and its marches often descended into violence. Gas grenades were thrown, police vehicles were vandalised and the police themselves were attacked. The EDL's goal was to stem the growth of a faith that it believed was corrupting the country. And in the grooming of white children, they saw not just a crime, but evidence of a broader Islamic agenda. Muslim gangs taking liberties in our towns and cities, taking liberties with non-Muslim youth, non-Muslim girls, raping, pimping, beating, abusing our whole system. As you can see behind me, there's a massive police presence in Bradford today. The squeamishness of the liberal establishment, and that includes the media, national politicians, police forces, social services, in actually confronting what was going on, left a void, and into that void marched the EDL to spread a completely poisoned, a divisive agenda. It had become quite personal for me. There was a sense of actually reclaiming this story from the wrong agenda, the far right's agenda, uh, and putting it um, squarely uh, where it should have been all along. We used every bit of software we had to try to look at, back at every criminal court case that there'd been in recent years in which two or more men had been convicted of sexual offences against girls who were aged 12 to 15, where the initial point of contact had been in a public place shopping mall, outside a bus station, train station, city centre, outside school gates. We needed to build that picture of all such cases because if we were going to say what um, I sense we might be going to say, which is that there was a specific pattern here involving men largely of the British Pakistani community committing offences against young white girls, we needed rock-solid evidential base. 
that trawling process produced cases involving the conviction of 56 men. Of those 56 men, three of them were white British men, um, 53 were Asian names, 50 of the 53 were Muslim names, the vast majority were British Pakistani. This was a process being repeated. It, it, it was happening in Birmingham, it was happening in Bradford, it was happening in Manchester, it was happening in Burnley. How had this pattern developed? How had it developed, apparently completely unseen by the authorities? How come every single aspect of the British establishment treated every single case that had cropped up as an isolated one-off case with no pattern whatsoever to any of the other cases that were so similar? The statistics were there. We needed to start talking to people about it and asking, what's going on here? What do you think? What are you doing about it? What are you not doing about it? We went to police forces. We approached local authorities. We went to specialist charities, government departments. Um, nobody would speak about this. Unbeknownst to Andrew Norfolk, in December 2010, Greater Manchester Police had acted. They'd launched an investigation, Operation Span, and had arrested nine men from Rochdale on suspicion of child sexual exploitation. DC Maggie Oliver, who years earlier had spent months investigating grooming, was once again asked to play a key role, to persuade child victims to provide evidence. My first response was, well, thanks very much, but no thanks. I've been here before in Operation Augusta. I do not want to be in that position again. They produced various policy documents that I had never seen in my 16 years of service. Please look at these documents. This is what we intend to do, but we need you to, you know, to bring these kids on board. They documented in great detail how we were going to treat these victims. It was completely different from Augusta. That would never happen again. It was recognised that we'd failed and it shouldn't, that shouldn't have happened. I thought, well, maybe Greater Manchester Police have learnt from what they failed to do back in 2004 and 5. Maybe this is a chance to address this, um, this crime, this on-street grooming once and for all. And eventually, I agreed that I would do my best. Four months into his investigation, and after countless dead ends, Andrew Norfolk finally found someone willing to talk to him on the record. A senior police officer heading a major investigation. He talked about having arrived in a new division and it was almost, he said, as though there was a box underneath the desk into which every case that was too difficult went. And there in that box was clear evidence over a period of years of what had been happening to girls in that town. And that was a town where basically the Pakistani community was four streets. It was tiny. And yet it was, it was even a generational thing there where you had fathers who had been doing this to the mothers of young girls who were now being groomed and abused by these men's sons. He spoke, he told me, to colleagues in the northwest of England, and he said a senior police officer in Lancashire said, listen, don't turn that stone. If you to turn that stone, you have no idea what's going to come out. Nine men were arrested just before Christmas over allegations of the sexual exploitation of teenage girls here in Rochdale. We understand that all the men are Asian, that they're aged between 20 and 40. We also understand that all the girls concerned are white. Now, police are saying that these arrests were made on suspicion of rape. Of As the investigation continued, Maggie Oliver was charged with winning the trust of two sisters with a long history of abuse. Both had had repeated contacts with the police and social services over the years. She quickly discovered their abuse was not only well known, but well documented. From reading social services records, it was abundantly clear 
that mum had been asking for help from social services over a long period of time. These children were on the Child Protection Register to be protected. The case conference notes themselves documented what mum was saying was happening to the children at the hands of these men. There were comments informing social workers that the children were being threatened at gunpoint, somebody had threatened to kill them if they went to the police. Mum, she got really irate, stood up and shouted, you know, what are you doing about these packies? Now, that's not my language, that's her language. Um, but they saw fit to throw her out of the meeting and at the same time did nothing about the abuse that she suspected was happening. The reality was she was telling them the truth. As part of that reading, it became apparent to me that there was another team um, uh, employed by so, uh, Rochdale Social Services called Crisis Intervention Team and they were the team that the children were visiting regularly. Until that time nobody had been aware that they'd existed. We needed those files. The Crisis Intervention Team handed the police thousands of documents detailing over a hundred assaults from the eight years they'd been open. It would have been easy for those who make the decisions on the Times to decide that no matter how horrific, this is a story that needed to be put somewhere other than the front page. But in the end, the reverse was decided. It was that this was a story so horrific and so controversial in terms of what we were going to be saying that the only place to put it was on the front page. And the lead in the Times is a culture of silence that has facilitated the ex sexual exploitation of hundreds of young British girls by criminal pimping gangs. The pattern of abuse and sexually the exploited in every British city and town. We had huge graphic inside showing different areas of the country where such crimes had been committed. There are calls for a nationwide investigation into the grooming and sexual abuse of vulnerable teenage girls. Within a couple of days, the government had ordered the first of what turned out to be two national inquiries. These young men are in a Western society. They're fizzing and popping with testosterone. Uh, they want an outlet uh, for that. And they see uh, these young women, white uh, girls who are vulnerable, who they think are easy meat. Jack Straw's comments on the racial background of men found of guilty of grooming young girls for sex. Former Home Secretary Jack Straw's comments. Held up as evidence that Asian women. gangs, specifically Pakistani men, represent a particular threat to young British girls today, which is not being confronted. It's much more comfortable in a society which most of the people living there, like, for example, me, all we want to do is be able to have people rubbing along together and communities rubbing along together and raising an issue like this doesn't make it easy because it, it, it asks hard questions. If you really want sex, there's prostitutes who are doing it. Why, why can't I get vulnerable girls? They haven't got no morals, they're monsters. They're, it's, just, it's just terrible. If you're like for Pakistani or something like that, you should be ashamed. Andrew had a statistics. This was hard facts about court cases people who had been convicted of crimes, not people who were accused of crimes, but people convicted. The evidence was compelling. There is a very small minority of people within the Pakistani community who are engaged in the phenomena of on-street gang grooming. There's an over-representation of British Pakistanis uh, in, the, in those types of crimes, and we've got to confront it. I, I did a piece for the Times. I wanted a reaction. I wanted people in the Pakistani community, I wanted people in wider society, whether it's the police, the politicians, um, you know, to actually debate this issue. The vast majority of paedophiles and people who are abusing children are not uh, of Pakistan. You should be respected, no matter what background they come from or what religion, you have to respect each other. These issues, it plays into the hands of extremists who are looking for an opportunity to stoke the fires of discord between communities. Talking about these girls like their statistics, 
They're not so, statistics. These girls are... Well, whose, whose daughters do you think these are? Th whose sisters? They're ours in working-class towns and communities. And people are right. fed up with what's going on. We're bit, and it is being ignored. There are only 15-year-old girls that you know that you've grown up with that have so, been raped or pimped. You don't. So I don't expect these are you to all, understand the these issues. These are all personal issues of yours. Personal issues in towns and cities. We can't like sweep mine. things under the carpet in Britain. But we don't because we don't like it. We've had it. It's been on. I'd rather on. talk about 2010 than talk about something that's been going on since 2003. And, 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 and actually, you should be commending the community. In May 2011, a new chief prosecutor for the northwest of England took office. He was Muslim, British Pakistani, and had a track record of taking on culturally sensitive cases. Having read the Times expose, he asked his staff if there were any potential grooming cases. Among the files he was presented was one on Girl A, the teenager from the takeaway two years earlier, whom the Crown prosecution had deemed an unreliable witness. The thing that struck me most, these are still children. You know, I have children of my own, and just because you're 14 or 15, you can't make informed choices. Uh, and the perpetrators were in their 40s, 50s, you know, my age, uh, who clearly knew better. When I read the prosecutor's advice to the officers in the earlier investigation, things like she has made a choice about her life. You know, she uh, has agreed to be, uh, in effect, a prostitute uh, for these men. Everything about it shocked me, to be blunt, because what groomers do, what perpetrators do, is manipulate. And the fact that she was chaotic and troubled uh, was actually the reason why she was targeted, because the perpetrator knew that nobody would believe her. I was absolutely certain in my mind that the decision taken in this case was wrong. That it wasn't just unreasonable, which is the test, uh, the legal test, it was wrong. And if it was wrong to maintain public confidence, I had to reverse that decision, and so I did. Nazir Afzal instructed Greater Manchester Police to build a case around Girl A. Officers began by focusing on other girls abused by the same men and invited Sarah Robotham and her team to police headquarters to help. The room was set up with uh, images of victims down one side of the room and images of perpetrators down the other side of the room. Me and my staff had, had not really ever seen the perpetrators and yet there they were, the nicknames associated with an image. And of course, we knew the crimes that they'd committed. We knew what they'd done. There is no one size fits all when it comes to a perpetrator. However, all of these men either worked in the nighttime economy, such so taxi drivers, takeaway restaurants, or they were solid members of the community, pretty much all employed, well known to each other. They all had marriages. Uh, they were all in relationships, many of them had children, outwardly were family men, they worked hard, they worked long hours, and they broke that up with the sexual abuse of children, which uh, to them was um, downtime. Most of the victims were traumatized from years of abuse by numerous men. They knew their accounts had been passed to authorities, but been met with total silence. Now, the police were asking them to cooperate and to drag up their painful pasts. The police come round. They were asking me a lot of difficult questions. I remember thinking, why are they asking me this now? Why couldn't they ask me years ago? I'd been arrested with Asians. My dad supported me missing. Why did they never ask me questions or anything? Back then they could have had loads of evidence. They could have got a file together. I stopped and said, they can't do it and just walked. I thought, if you didn't help me in the past, why am I going to help you now? There was a lot of pressure from the police. It was like, you'll help us so much. I trusted them. Gave them the names of the people that had done stuff to me and I told them a lot about me. It was like a sigh of relief. Like, thinking, at least something's going to happen now. 
At first I said no. I didn't want to talk to the police. They just kept saying, look, it's not your fault, it's not your fault. In the end I started a load of interviews. I told the police about when I got locked in the flat, the razor blade incident. I gave the police names, any clothes that I could remember that I'd worn. I gave like as much detail as I possibly could. In the end, I'd done something like 29 hours worth of interviews. As dozens of officers worked to build a case, one of the sisters who Maggie Oliver worked with remained tight-lipped. It took months before she finally opened up. She told me what had happened to them. Tiny details of her worst nightmares. She took me on drive around, showed me locations where the abuse had happened, onto the moors, into really remote places. There was no houses around, there were no lights. Children up there would not be seen by anybody. To think of being up there, drunk, on your own, with a, a man who's three times your age, was actually really scary. When one of those children tells me what's happened, they're putting their faith in you. They are reliving all that abuse. They are talking about it in the most horrific detail. I was 14 when the abuse started. We were on between three and four years. I was raped by about 50 um, men. Maybe more, I've lost count. It happened that many times. I felt ashamed that I'd had sex with so many older men. I disgusted in myself, really. I kept it in a box, you know, locked away in my head. To open that box and tell Maggie everything that happened was really hard. Her account was added to what was countless hours of evidence from other victims. As prosecutors poured through multiple ID parades, drive throughs and physical evidence, it became clear how difficult the case would be to win and that not all the victims could be called as witnesses. I was told at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon that the police were no longer, and I quote, going to use this girl. And I was in, I couldn't believe it. I had put my heart and soul into bringing these children on board on absolute guarantees and assurances that there would not be a repeat of what happened in Operation Augusta. And here I was back in the same place. But on this occasion, it wasn't just one interview that this child had given. It was six months of her life. I felt it was immoral, inhuman, unprofessional. I couldn't believe it. I thought the defensive strategy was going to be, say these girls are lying. How can you believe them because of their drug taking and, and their criminal records or whatever? I had to select the strongest victims to ensure that the one opportunity that we had to try this case was taken. I knew that they were going to be cross-examined in the courtroom up to 11 times, each of them. Being cross-examined once, uh, is extremely traumatic and 11 times about some of the most intimate things that can happen to you or have happened to you. Uh, I knew that they had to be really strong. I had to make a judgment about how many of them we were going to rely upon. Six girls were chosen to testify. Their graphic accounts of assault under the noses of the authorities would finally push the grooming story onto the front pages. Even before it started, this case attracted hundreds of protesters. With 11 men on trial, most of them taxi drivers. There was a huge policing operation to try to protect the integrity of the case. Police officers on horses, protesters from the far right, mass ranks of police officers. Almost every media organization in the country that has a national focus was there for the opening of that trial. 
11 men have gone on trial charged with grooming and sexually exploiting girls as young as 13. The Asian men described as being predatory sex offenders. These are some of the 11 men who are facing trial at Liverpool Crown Court. All the defendants are of Asian heritage and aged between 22 and 59. They face a total of 22 counts, including sexual assault, rape and trafficking. They're said to have passed girls between themselves, then pass them on to friends and associates. And if they think it's OK in Pakistan, then go back to Pakistan. If it's OK in Albania, go back to Albania. But don't do it here in our country. Everyone was talking about it. It was all over social media, and I was like slap bang right in the middle of it. I was so scared. And I got to go and stand up in court in front of all these people. It was hard. I was young. I just had a kid. I had no family to come with me. I had my daughter in a car seat in the court. One of the ushers looked after my daughter. So it was literally me in the middle of court on my own. As I was telling what happened to girl A, I was just reliving the stories that I'd been through as well. As I was telling it, I was kind of breaking down and I started crying in court. And I had the whole of the jury sat there crying with me. What else can you tell us about the victims? Well, there were five of them. The youngest was aged just 13, and she, in fact, became pregnant. These are girls from troubled backgrounds. Uh, they were initially flattered by the compliments of these men. Then she became scared. And then, in her words, after that, it just didn't bother her anymore. Some lines that those girls used, chilling. The girl who had first met her boyfriend, as she called him, who was a married man in his 40s when she was 12. She'd got pregnant, she'd had an abortion at 13. You'd meet one, she used the adjective packy to describe the man. Meet one packy, within 10 days you got 10 packies in your phone book. Within a few weeks you've got a whole phone book full of packies. And she would be rung up by randomers, men she didn't know at all. She would go and stand in a car park in the middle of Hayward and wait to be collected, taken to an address she didn't know, plied with alcohol, and then passed around for sex. And she thought these guys were kind because they took an interest in her. One of the men is alleged to have told a girl, it's part of the deal because I bought you vodka. You have to give me something. Uh, but she refused to have sex with him. And at that point, the court was told he raped her and uh, told her, don't cry, I love you. I refused to go to the court. I said, I'm only doing it for a video link. Hearing their names alone is enough. I wouldn't have been able to go to a courtroom. When it came to getting asked questions by the barristers, that was when I didn't want to be there. The names that they called me were worse than I was pre-warned. I was called a slut, that I hoard myself out for um, 10 pounds per session. And they'd keep digging. I was screaming at them crying tears and then they'd carry on. Even the judge, I think it was on two occasions, had to say, okay, you need to tone it down a little bit because it was, it was disgusting. I certainly became aware of the cross-examination of the main ringleader. The moment where he decided to uh, pull, pull open his shirt and, and throw his hair into the courtroom uh, to suggest that, of course, the victim would know that he had a hairy chest because all men have a hairy chest. Then he moved on to uh, abuse white people generally to say that uh, the reason why he had taken her in uh, and, uh, and in effect that she was accompanying him is because the white communities of this country had let her down. 
You, the white communities of this country, have neglected these girls. Is it no wonder that they come to us? It made it very clear to the jury that this was much more complicated than straightforward he did or he didn't do it. Uh, he may have done it, uh, as he suggested, but he seemed to have a reason for doing it. And, and somehow he wanted to blame the whole of British white community for allowing these young girls to be so vulnerable that they became available to him. It became very uncomfortable because he was absolutely right. Social services have let down these young girls. Police and prosecutors and every other justice agency have let down these young girls. Schools, health, every agency in this country has let down victims of sexual abuse and particularly child victims of sexual abuse over generations. And so he was saying something that was absolutely true, uh, but it did not justify his abuse of her, which is what he was trying to do. He went on to describe one 15-year-old who he's accused of raping on a number of occasions as being loud and aggressive. He said she was a racist, even a prostitute. He said that she was like a bone in a kebab. It was at times unrelenting in terms of the sheer grimness of it. These were treated as consenting kids who were choosing to make money or have a bit of fun, as in, you know, somewhere to stay warm, somewhere to have free food, free booze, choosing this lifestyle and, you know, who are we to stop them getting on with it? Tonight, after 11 weeks, the case which centres on Rochdale involving the grooming and abuse of teenage girls has finally ended. Including rape and trafficking. The victims were girls aged just 13 to 15. These men said the victims chosen by these defendants, quote, were chosen because they were not of your community. I remember vividly the day the verdicts came in and I remember sitting in my front room on my own watching Steve Haywood walk out onto the steps at Liverpool Crown Court and give a statement on behalf of Greater Manchester Police. Okay. Um, this has been a fantastic result for British justice. These victims have been through the most horrendous of crimes and I just want to commend their bravery in relation to the ordeal they've had to go through. These are the most vulnerable in our society and they have been preyed upon by adults who should know better. There were so many feelings going through me when I saw him on those steps, and it, it crystallised everything I was feeling about the whole on-street grooming. I would also like to thank my officers for the profession... He had been in charge of child protection at the time of Operation Augusta. He was the man I had face-to-face -face meetings with. He knew full well what on-street grooming was. You saw Victoria's photograph. You saw her letter. You knew that Operation Augusta was a live and running job. You knew what the offender profile was. You read my report. You were part of the officers who authorised it to go to the major incident team. And you were one of the ones who dropped that job. Thank you very much. You are, you it was is a statement by the police that they believe there may be dozens more victims in this particular case. That day, the news media were covering it 24-7. This is the most striking front page, a nation's shame. You know, I have not known anything like it in my life. A horrendous case under the... There was real shock at uh, what this case had uncovered. There was a sense of how, where is it, where else is it happening? How many other perpetrators are there? How much abuse is going on? Why is this happening? What's our responsibility? This is about power and it's about sexual exploitation. All but one of the men was from Pakistan. The ninth was from Afghanistan. Right wing. Two questions they wanted to know. One was, why hadn't he been prosecuted before? What does it say about the justice system? Two, was this a race issue? The fact is, we cannot use this as a tool to generalize and cascade every person who happens to be brown, whether they're Asian, in all Asian. communities, all ethnicities, all religions. A most vile, degenerate person that will prey on young, innocent girls does not take race into account. They go after girls, simple. And I think by saying, oh, they go after... In the days and weeks after the Rochdale verdict, 
the issue of race wouldn't go away. I think the police are wrong to say that race isn't a key factor in this. This is an issue within the Asian community, a small group of Asian men. These nine men did not commit this abuse because they're all Pakistani and Afghan in origin. They did it because they are vile scum, and vile scum exists in all Every races. community and every race has its sex abusers. I'm a Muslim myself, and we are... Alcohol is forbidden, drugs is forbidden, sexual abuse is forbidden. All of these things these men were surrounded by. So uh, they, it's not as if the Quran was a, their handbook uh, for, for the abuse of these, these young girls. They, they surrounded themselves with everything that was forbidden by Islam. Tariq, good morning. Well, I see it's evil is evil. Um, it's like the last 20 years we've had an underclass in this country. It's incredibly sad that a young girl feels she's special because she's given a kebab. Pattern of sexual exploitation is a national problem. It's not particular to one culture or race. And I think the environment... As the country grappled with the fallout from the Rochdale trial, more and more cases came to light. A 14-year-old girl was taken to a house in Briarfield. Some under current investigation some from the past. Exploiting children has become a social norm in a region where just one in five police officers are trained. I could barely believe what I was reading. I thought that Keithley was the only place in the universe where this sort of stuff was going on. Uh, and then I discovered, to my horror really, uh, that it had been going on in all these other towns, but no one was talking about it. I just wish that people would have understood uh, the sort of dreadful situations that these girls were going through. Uh, their lives would have been completely changed and why couldn't people understand that we had to move heaven and earth if necessary to stop this sort of thing happening? Various inquiries were already underway to investigate not just Rochdale and Greater Manchester, but the national picture. Dealing with vulnerable victims, we've long had operations against things like child prostitution, Operation it's Messenger. It's not fair to say we did nothing. We did do something. We perhaps didn't do as, as effectively as we would have liked to, and that's it's resulted the lack of sharing of data across services. As the inquiries tried to understand how and why so many children had been let down, Maggie Oliver began going through her files on Operation Span. She was shocked to find that some of the evidence she managed to gather from one of the sisters appeared to be missing from the police database. When one child tells the police that she has been raped by in excess of 30 men and Greater Manchester Police choose not to make an official record of any of those allegations, that is out and out neglect. That is your basic role as a police officer, that you gather the evidence. You don't make a snap judgment whether you agree with somebody or you don't and decide not to record it. It is your job as a police officer to record it. There is no record that that child disclosed those offences. Now, the scary thing, quite apart from the consequences for her, the other consequence of that is that those men might be abusing other children. Social workers, police and prosecutors have been criticised for missing opportunities to stop the abuse of young girls in Rochdale. As various reviews started to publish their findings, the official government inquiry was nearing the end of its six-month investigation. ...continued grooming and rape of a number of girls. It's believed there were around 50 of them and some may have been as young as 10. Committee members had heard from senior executives and managers. Now they called on Sarah Robotham hoping that someone with 10 years on the front line would be able to clarify the scale of the problem and why it had been ignored for so long. Uh, and I'm quoting for the report, overall child welfare organisations missed opportunities to provide a comprehensive, coordinated and timely response. Yeah, I, Do you agree with that? Absolutely, I, I would absolutely agree with that. I think the report makes reference starts at 2007 and I'd like to suggest that that happened much earlier, um, from 2004. Over that period of time, um, I, I made 181 alerts to children's social care. 181 alerts? When those referrals weren't acted upon, mm. um, did you take any further action? As far as I'm concerned, I told everybody that these children were being abused. Let me be blunt. Do you think the failure in Rochdale was due to incompetence or indifference? 
It was attitudes towards teenagers. It was absolute disrespect that vulnerable young people did not have a voice. They were, they were overlooked. They were discriminated against. They were, uh, they were treated appallingly by, by protective services. If Greater Manchester Police had followed what we knew to be happening um, in relation to Operation Augusta back in 2004 and 5, I know 100% that this kind of crime would not have escalated to the proportions that we now see. As a community, as a country, we're trying to play catch up with a, a crime that has become um, frighteningly its epidemic proportions. I hope that now we realise we can't turn a blind eye. Um, I just think it's too little, too late. Um, and I f I'm heartbroken about the, the kids in the middle of it who have been let down. Yes, people got stuff wrong in the past. Uh, people weren't prosecuted, they should have been. Victims weren't given the level of support they should have been. Uh, but, you know, when I left the service, at that time I knew that they were doing as good a job as they possibly could. It was, even despite all the kind of terror work that we're doing right now, child sexual abuse was the number one priority for Greater Manchester Police. They resourced it, they put people of expertise in there, uh, and there are potentially hundreds of suspects. Yes. The abuse of young girls in Rochdale and Keighley and Oxford and Telford and everywhere else in this country where it's happening is the tip of the iceberg. You know, I've said before, there are probably as many children as you could fill into Wembley Stadium, 100,000 a year, who are being abused every year. And therefore, we're just beginning this journey. But you've got to start somewhere. I wish it had never happened. I wish I had a childhood. I wish I did things like a normal family would, just random things like going down to the forest and making pictures with leaves and stuff or sleepovers and things like that. Nothing could ever bring justice to me, I don't think. It's not something that's ever going to make me feel better. Your thoughts last forever. Details of organisations offering information and support with child sexual abuse are available at the BBC Action Line website or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 077 077.